it's time for us to check back in with Verna May and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. I guess every woman anywhere wants her wedding day to be one to remember. A happiness to share with all her friends and relations. Well, mine was not like that. We were married in secret. It was not even in the day, but at night. One Sunday, May 17, 1936, after dark, we walked around to Preacher Billy's who lived then on Sparkman Branch with only the two necessary witnesses, Cora and Victor Sparkman. We were united to be separated no more except by death. A mountain wedding was usually a very big affair. A big dinner the first day at the bride's home, another just as large called the inn fair at the bridegroom's the second day. Everyone was invited. Sometimes the neighbors would chivalry the couple, making a lot of noise, singing and shouting as they marched around their house, maybe taking the man for a ride on a rail and the woman in a wash tub. All good, simple, wholesome fun. As with everything else, some might get drunk. A very traditional dish for a wedding dinner was chicken and dumplings. The two were associated so much that it became a joke. You did not ask someone if they were going to get married, but when can we expect some chicken and dumplings? If a boy kept visiting the same girl for a while, they seemed to be getting serious. My father would say that when the old hen saw them coming, they ran and hid. I remember what happened to our first pig. It was almost fat enough to kill. There wasn't anything wrong when we fed it supper, but next morning it was dead. It had been such a pet, I don't think I would have eaten any of it anyway. Its name was Sarmal. My husband asked the neighbors who owned joining farms to our small lot permission to bury the dead pig on their land, and both refused. He went and got his father's mule and hauled it to his father's farm. Someone threatened to indict him for taking it along a public road but there was nothing else he could do. We did not want to burn or bury it that close to our home. I wish I had words to describe our first home. My children sometimes ask, Mom, were you not ashamed to live like that? No, we were lucky. We did have a place of our own. Many of our friends had to live with one or the other's parents when first married. There had been an old log house, one larger room with a very large chimney, then another room had been added from sawed lumber. The log house had been torn down, the logs laying in the yard. My husband later built a barn with them. The plank room was the one we lived in. The fireplace had been planned to hold logs for fuel, then later a smaller opening had been made for a grate by walling up the sides with rocks. The one room was about 22 feet wide and at least 10 feet to the ceiling, very unusually high. It had a big loft that could be used for storage room. In fact, I think it had been used for a bedroom, beds being made on the floor for extra children. We only used it for a junk room. Our furniture consisted of two iron beds. I still have one of them. My sewing machine, his talking machine, record player. His Uncle Billy gave us what had one time been a wood cook stove known as a step stove made to burn wood for fuel. It got the name because the two back caps, or lids, burners to you, were of a higher level than the front two. It had lost all its legs and most of the doors. One lid was missing, but I solved that by keeping my iron kettle there. As long as I remembered to keep water in the kettle, everything was fine. Willie solved the problem of the lost legs by sawing four wooden ones from a tree trunk. The only thing wrong with that was we were always afraid they would get hot and catch on fire. We always poured water on them before going to bed. He also made me a wall shelf for my dishes and a table from split boards made smooth with a drawing knife. I had a trunk, the only thing I had that belonged to my mother, and there was only one room. I guess it's a good thing we did not own very much furniture. With the $50 we saved from our NYA job, we bought enough lumber to build a lean-to kitchen and a porch onto our house. Willie and his brothers did all the work. Harlan Watts came and helped to rive split boards from white oak taken from my father-in-law's farm. I guess I was just about the proudest person alive then. 
Not proud in a mean way, just real thankful for what I had. By the time our first son was born, we had two rooms to our house, and by the time our second arrived, we owned a farm and two houses. Then why did we keep it secret? We both were working on the NYA, National Youth Administration, one of President Roosevelt's programs. It was for single people. We wanted to keep our jobs as long as we could. Maybe this was a little wrong, but mountain folks did not look at it that way. Anything you can get from the government is fair. Most of them really like to outwit the authorities and law enforcers. People who are too honest to take one penny from a neighbor will lie to take hundreds of dollars from Uncle Sam. I guess that's kind of true everywhere, but more so in the mountains. Willie's job with the NYA was in a different district. He and the other boys painted and repaired school and church houses. The boys on Caney worked at the school and made chairs for Mrs. Lloyd. We girls made quilts out of the clothes from the exchange, scrubbed the homemade chain, and washed windows. The NYA program was set up so as to help as many young folks as they could. Each group was allowed only a few months' work, then different ones were hired. Willie and I had planned on waiting until our jobs were finished to get married to save as much of our money as we could to buy some stuff to set up housekeeping. A lot of things happened that caused us to change our minds. I had swapped my part of the old home place farm at the mouth of Trace to a horse and garden on Bunyan in the head of Caney. Here my father and stepmother lived. I stayed with them when I was not at school. Uncle Sam Sumner had died and his wife, Aunt Clendia, known by everyone as Aunt Hen, lived near the college with her foster son, Caney. Caney was the real son of Uncle John Sumner and his wife, Ethel, who had both died, leaving five orphans. In a case like this, the children were always raised by the next of kin. It would have been unthought of for children to be sent to an orphan's home or adopted by strangers. They must be raised by relatives and grow up in the same family. Aunt Hen had raised a very large family of her own, and they were, at this time, all married. She lived in a large two-story building. She wanted my father and stepmother to move in the lower part of the house. It was lonesome for her and Caney by themselves. I guess my father and Barbara also wanted to be with folks their own age, so it was arranged they would move and let me have my own house. Also, if we had not married early enough in the spring to plant a garden and some corn, we would have had no food for the first winter. We did not like the idea of staying in the house with his parents as many newlyweds did, and there was no way I wanted to stay with my stepmother. With everything considered, we decided to get married in secret. It was not a secret very long. I was married only nine months and two weeks when our first son was born. I worked up until a week before his birth. One of my cousins was the boss over our project. No one ever reported on Willie that he was a married man, but it seems as if someone was sending in a report on me every week or so. All my relatives and close friends knew it, but they wanted me to keep my job. When my cousin would get a notice from the government asking him if one of his employees was a married woman, he would have to come to me and ask. I would be standing there so pregnant that I looked like a cow. I would laugh and say, No, do I look like I am? We worked two days a week and received $8 a month. After a few weeks, I got a raise to $10 for being timekeeper. You won't believe we saved $50 that first summer. We also tried to buy something from each check for our home. A sheet, a couple of towels, a few teaspoons, or a fry pan. Did we think of this as being poor or deprived? Far from it. We were happy. We were glad we could do it. When you have no big things, the little ones become important. We had our help, a place to live. We could grow all the food we needed. I remember canning several hundred quarts of apples, tomatoes, beets, beans, kraut, berries, cucumbers, peppers, peaches, and peas. I made a few dozen pints of apple and berry jelly, blackberry jam, and apple butter. I dried beans, kushal, pumpkins, and apples. 
we had a whole of Irish potatoes and a barrel of sweet potatoes, each one wrapped separate in a piece of newspaper. A few bushels of onions were drying in the loft. Squashes and cushions were rolled under the beds, the smaller ones to feed the hogs. I also had several bags of shelled beans for soup beans. We had enough food to feed an army. Willie's sister gave us a few hens and my sister gave me a rooster. We did not have a cow. In fact, we bought our first cow three or four years later. There are so many things I would love to tell you about my first home, our jobs with the NYA program and all the fun we had. Once us girls got locked in the old science building and no one could hear us hollering, so I crawled out a window and dropped to the ground, then went for help. One time we got caught in a flash flood and had to stay all night. It was a good thing the boys were on the right side of the creek and let our folks know where we were. I was still taking some classes in high school then. The time I spent in school also counted as work time. I know some of the other NYA girls resented this, so I tried to make up for it by working harder, bringing the quilts home to him. My husband bought some blue wallpaper for our home, the only kind of wallpaper we could get then. It was a heavy grade known as ceiling paper. Until then, it had always come in a brown color. It was not put up with paste, but with little bright shiny disc with a tack in the center. Some people saved buying the buttons and cut small pieces of cardboard from old shoe boxes to keep the tacks from pulling through the paper. The ceiling of our house was so high, it was some job to get the paper up. Some of the NYA co-workers came on their day off and helped me. We had a lot of fun. When finished, one girl said, it sure is a tacky job. We used several boxes of tacks. I remember how I solved the problem of keeping my milk and butter fresh. We had a dug well. Many folks would let the bucket of jar of milk down in the well on a rope. I tried this, but then you had to pull up the milk in order to draw the water. Oh boy, if you happened to spill the milk, then the well had to be cleaned out, all the water bailed out, then someone go down in the well, and with clean water wash the sides of the walls which had been made from creek rocks placed one on the other. The uneven sides came in handy as a ladder but the many footholds and crevices made the cleaning more difficult. There was a big bell flower apple tree that covered our well. Under this tree I dug a large hole and sank a 50 pound empty lard can. Each morning I would fill it with fresh cold water from the well. There I would keep my milk, butter, eggs, and leftovers. A lot of trouble? Sure. Now I grumble when I have to clean my automatic defrost and refrigerator. If someone had told me then that I would ever see a refrigerator, let alone own one, I would have said, yeah, and the sun is going to come up in the west tomorrow. There was something that happened about this time, a small thing, but a mystery I was never able to solve. Our chickens I knew by name. Sure, we named some of our favorite chickens, some I still remember. There was the keen hen, old Billy Boggs, a large black rooster that was a very special pet of Vernon's, then old Hitler, the mother of a hundred of friars. My sister Frances owned her. She received the name Hitler because of her disposition. The chickens roosted in some trees back of our house. One morning when they came off the roost, there were two newcomers, a red and white speckled rooster and a pullet about frying size. They seemed just as much at home as my own chickens. I asked all the neighbors if they were theirs. No one had ever heard of them. I left word at the local country store and told the postmaster to help me. Until this day, I don't know where they come from. It was the custom if folks were moving that they would take the chickens in the night because sometimes the heat of the day could cause them to die. Someone moving a long way who went through here could have lost them. We had not heard anyone pass during the night, nor were there any wagon tracks. My first son was born March the 3rd. We slept late that morning. I knew I was in labor when I awoke. Willie had been keeping his father's mule so as to be ready, a mountain expression, he had been sleeping with his shoes on. 
On his way to bring the midwife, he stopped and sent my sister, Renda, to take care of me until he got back. Doorbell asked Willie if he would wait until she milked her cow. He waited, but the baby did not. She only had time to wash her hands after arriving. She helped him into the world, still wearing her hat and coat. A lot has been written about our hillbilly granny women. There was a lot of superstition connected with childbirth, but there was no foolishness about Dora Bell Taylor Gibson. She had taught herself from reading books. She knew as much as a doctor. She had a medical license to practice. She did not believe in using painkilling drugs. She could understand because she had been 48 hours in hard labor herself when one of hers was born, yet she did not care to call in a man doctor when she saw the need of one. She delivered four of my five boys. If she was alive today, I would be willing to risk my grandchildren to her care. Another one of our good, common people. In the old days when a child was born, they had what was called a granny frolic. The expectant mother prepared as if for a party. All the neighbor women were asked to come. After the baby was born, someone would ring the dinner bell so everyone would understand everything was all right. Then they would cook themselves a good dinner, no men allowed. It was a day for women only. For some reason, I can't understand, they always cut up the father's hat if he did not have it hid where they could not find it. Maybe that was supposed to bring good luck. When my baby was born, many of these traditions were no longer observed, but we still had a nice dinner. When they were all in the kitchen eating, I finally looked at my son. Up until then, he had only been a new toy. I'd looked forward to taking care of him, making pretty clothes, and showing him off. There lying in my bed with him, soft by my side, it suddenly hit me like a streak of light. This is another human being, a new soul. It all depended on me, if he ate, if he got hungry, if he stayed warm, if he fared good or bad, if he was taught not to lie, not to steal, to love his neighbors. Just out of the blue, it struck me what a big responsibility this really was, and I said, Oh God, I can't do it myself. Will you help me? Maybe I did not have all the nice things I wanted for him when he was little and had to wash his homemade clothes on a washboard, but God answered my prayer. I did just as much for him as the richest mother that ever lived. I did all I could with what I had to do with, and I brought him up the way God told me to in his good book. Now I can say I am very proud of him and his four brothers. I think that is another thing that made the family so close in the past. The father, grandparents, aunts, and so on were there when the child was born. Some of my greatest regrets are that I never saw any of my sons get married, nor was I present when any of my grandchildren were born. For the first few hours of their lives, they seemed to belong more to the doctors and nurses than to my family. My father made my first son a very beautiful handmade crib bed from Walnut. I kept him in the crib during the day, and at night I let him sleep in bed with me. I don't care what doctors say, I believe it best for the mother and child to be together. I also breastfed all my children. These new mothers are losing two of the greatest blessings that God gave mothers, the pleasure of sleeping with your child and letting it nurse, a closeness that cannot be understood unless you have experienced it. How can you expect to hold on to them later in life if you begin their lives by pushing them away? My husband's next job after he had finished his NYA allotment was with his grandfather, Isom Sloan, at Beaver Dam, Kentucky. Isom had remarried after being divorced from his first wife, Willie's grandmother, Ferry. He bought a farm at Beaver Dam, which contained a large boundary of trees. He was logging this timber and wanted Willie to help his son, Isom Jr., cut the logs and get them out of the woods. Willie received one dollar a day and free board. He left home Sunday evening and came back Friday night. I had to stay by myself. I didn't mind staying alone, but now I had the baby to think of. We had no close neighbors and I was scared, afraid he would get sick or something. I sure was glad when the job ended and Willie got his slip saying he was eligible for work with the WPA. He was to be one of the men to build the road from Garner to Pippa Passes. 
This road was built with only picks and shovels. The only other tools were churn drills to drill the holes for blasting out rocks. Our hills are more rock than anything else. The other day I heard a man remark that the WPA workers were given a piece of wood and told to whittle it. That is not the way I remember it. These men who built that road worked hard through one of the coldest winters Caney ever saw. They had little brush fires built along the road but were only allowed to sit around the fire during their lunch break. I have known several times when their dinners would be frozen. My husband had a thermos in which to take hot coffee but some of the men did not have that comfort. There was a little wooden shanty built where they kept their tools. Willie got the job of night watchman to guard those tools. We were both pleased with this change. Of course, this meant me being alone at night, but it got him out of the cold weather. From all these jobs, we had managed to save a few dollars, and with the gift of some from my father, in 1939, we had enough to make the down payment on a small farm that joined our lot. It had a much newer and better house. The new house had only two rooms. We tore down the old house and with the best of the lumber added two more rooms to our house. I thought now that we owned a farm, maybe my husband would be willing to stay at home, but he kept saying, I must find a well-paying job. I have no education, so I must learn some trade. I must have money so I can send my children to college. Mrs. Lloyd was helping a lot of folks through school, and I'm almost sure she would have helped us, but we did not want that. We wanted to do it ourselves. I always say that the reason me and Willie get along so well together is because we both do exactly what I want done. I say this as a joke, but there is a lot of truth in this. He leaves almost all important decisions up to me. But in one case, this was not so, and I am very glad to admit I was wrong and he was right. One evening, about dark, we were sitting on our porch. We had finished laying by our corn. Our garden was all hoed out. Until everything became ready to harvest, we would have a few weeks rest. Talt Watts, who was one of our neighbors who had a farm in the head of Watts Creek, tended the farm but had a job in the coal mines, he come by. After talking for a while, he said, Willie, I would like for to get you to come and plow my corn tomorrow. I have several work hands coming to hoe corn, but only have one man to plow. Well, Willie began, I have other plans for tomorrow. Other plans, I ask. You know you don't have anything that needs doing. Well, I sure wish you could see your way to coming. I need you, and I have seen you plow. I will give you double wages, two dollars a day. My corn is ruining away in the weeds. Willie answered, No, I wish I could help you out, and that's more than a fair price, but I have other things to do. After Talt had left with the parting words, Well, if you change your mind, come on, I demanded, What are these other all-important plans? And to my astonishment, he said, I am going with my cousin who's promised to teach me how to run a bulldozer. And how much will you get for this? Nothing, of course, except to learn how. What? You would turn down two dollars a day and go work for nothing? That night when he set the clock to alarm an hour earlier than usual, I said, You need not have it to alarm. I won't get you any breakfast unless you plan on going to plow. And he answered, then I will eat with my cousin. And that's what he did. I heard him leave next morning without speaking. For the next few weeks, he worked with his cousin. In less than two months, he had a job as a helper to the bulldozer driver at the unbelievable rate of $15 a day. In a few years, he had a job with Kentucky West Virginia Gas Company where he remained until he retired in 1974 10 years as a bulldozer driver and 21 as a well operator. A job with one of the gas companies is the most sought after position by the laboring class of people in eastern Kentucky and once you are in the union you have almost a guaranteed job for life. So you see how pleased we were. When his first check came each one of the boys wanted to get it from the mailbox and bring it into the house. 
Willie Vernon got mad because losses outdone him and carried the check to me, so he snatched it and threw it in the fire. Willie had to embarrassingly explain this to his boss and get it replaced. There was one drawback to this job. Willie had to stay away from home now more than ever. In fact, during the war years, he was sometimes gone for weeks at a time, building roads, wrenching pipes up the hill as the gas company drilled more and more wells. He got a deferment from the draft as his job was classed as essential to the war effort. Another fascinating peek into the, into the life of uh, Verna May. Lots of humor in this part, too. I love the beginning when she says that chicken and dumplings was the um, most common meal for weddings. Isn't that wonderful? That's so comforting. Of course, today, we, you know, weddings usually have some kind of some kind of fancy fare going on, certainly not chicken and dumplings, but I love that. And I love that it was so common that people all actually said, are you ready for some chicken and dumplings? Are you about, are you courting? Are you about to get, about to get married? I really enjoyed her description of her first little home, how proud she was of it. And it's like she's, she was trying to kind of explain about the word proud, not like I'm proud, I'm better than you, but that's kind of like an Appalachian way of saying if you're proud, really you're just pleased. If I said I'm, I'm proud to be here, it would just mean I'm pleased to be here, not that I'm uh, proud kind of in a haughty way. Um, but I loved her description of it and how she was so tickled over every little piece that they got and how wonderful it was they didn't have to live with his parents or with her parents and and just how tickled they were to be there for themselves two things that really jumped out at me about that part when she was talking about that was um i love the part where she said um if you have no big things then you you know you the little things become important in other words it's what she was saying if you have no big things then your thoughts for the little things they just become more important um, I really love that. It, we're all, it's human nature like that. It's kind of like the more you have of something, the less you appreciate it. I know I'm guilty of that. But if you don't have anything, if you live like a life of scarcity, whether it's thinking about food or, or the, you know, furniture that Verna May was describing, then you really value, you really just take care of what you've got and value it and, um, and really, really treasure it. Um, kind of silly comparison, but it reminds me of when I was, I was probably in middle school or something when I first started noticing that what other, you know, the cool kids, what they wore, and like the first pair of, um, in those days I could convince Granny and beg and plead, and she'd buy me one nice pair of tennis shoes every year to start school in, and buddy, I took care of them. I only wore them to school. I didn't wear them outside where they get dirty, and I scrubbed them with a toothbrush and kept them clean, but I so valued those shoes. Well, then, as as an adult when I can pretty much go buy myself any kind of shoes I want I don't I don't care nothing about it it's just so different I don't know it's it's that what she was saying when you have when you don't really have the big things then the little things become so much more important and that kind of ties back to what she was saying in last week's book about how it's those little things that make up your life the little little moments that make up instead of the big drastic ones so I really liked that part. And then I liked the really thought-provoking when she was talking about getting married, why they got married in secret, is, you know, she told all those reasons. But one of it was, one reason was that it was in the, they had to get married before spring so that they could plant their garden, so they could prepare for their crops, or else they wouldn't have anything to eat come winter. Such a different time than we live in today. Um, I mean, just so different people we don't think about that of course we don't think about that most people don't because we can go to the grocery store and all that don't think of it on any you know any kind of scenario on a daily basis but thinking that she actually had to plan her wedding so that she knew well we got to we got to get ahead so we'll have to start planting come spring or we won't have anything to eat we'll starve so that part really i mean it's just wow such a different time and um so fascinating to think about how that was one of her one of their main concerns um, the putting the milk in the lard can and putting it down in the well i would have never thought about what if it spills but then all that milk would be in there it might spoil your water if it decayed so that would have been a mess uh, really smart how she figured out to to dig the hole and put the lard can and then put the cool water in it Somebody like Verna May, I, I feel like my daddy Pap was like that too. Now he was a little bit younger than Verna May. She's talking about that she got married like in those late 
1930s that she was mentioning pap was built or was born in 1937 so he was just a baby when she was getting married uh, but still so many drastic changes so she went from digging a hole to put her lard bucket in to cool her her milk and her leftovers and her butter to having a refrigerator such a difference and of course pap did that too his family they had a spring house and then eventually they you know started using refrigerators such such changes when she's talking about her her son her first son being born and the midwife the granny woman barely getting there i really like what she said the tradition was and it had already fell out of fashion even when she was having her child even way back then but the granny frolic <laughs> how they would cook and all the women would kind of get together that's that's really uh, heartwarming and um, really precious is her describing when they were in there eating, having their dinner, um, how she suddenly realized her son and what that meant and, and that awesome responsibility. I always said with, I only had, me and Matt only had Corey and Katie, but I always said the thing about having children there is that physical you know the physical labor especially when they're babies and you've got to feed them and um, you know you have every they cry you've got to take care of them every need as they get older that gets less in some ways but then you've got to worry about them getting hurt and tearing up stuff and getting into stuff and all that that there's physical labor but the the hardest part of being a parent is that awesome responsibility that Verna May was saying that she all of a sudden realized. It is the the day to day teaching them over and over and over, repeating the same things and teaching them, you know, your values that are important to you and uh, teaching them how to be a good human. That's that that is the overwhelming uh, hard part of being a parent, if you ask me. I do remember the same thing with Corey and Katie. It's like when you first have them, and especially I had two, and I had a C-section, and I was in the hospital, and I didn't feel that good myself, and I had been on bed rest for so long that I had lost all my strength. I had no strength left when I had them. I really had to build back up my strength. Um, but once I got got here and everybody was gone and probably mad and went back to work or whatever, that's when I could really bond with Corey and Katie and, and really kind of get in, I guess, get your rhythm going. And oh my goodness, I remember just the feeling of just being like, oh, this is what I was created for. These children, look at them, you know, this precious, look at both of them. And this is what I was created for. And that, that mother bond really grew. So I really enjoyed that part of Verna May. And then the ending, just so funny, the boys fighting over the uh, the check. And I liked the part, you know, Verna May's admitting I was totally wrong. He was right. And then he ended up with a job that paid $15 a day. You know, remember the first job he had paid a dollar a day. So he was making $15 a day. They had to feel like they were rich in some ways. Um, anyway, that she was wrong, but then the funny part that the boy's fighting over the check and one of them burned it. <laughs> that's that's another comical thing. Today, most of us don't get paper checks anymore. We just get it deposited straight into our bank account. So that's another thing that's that's really changed. I can remember when I was in high school, I lost two of my checks. Uh, I don't remember. I think both of them was when I worked at Cato's. I worked at McDonald's and Cato's. One of them had just got stuck in some other papers and put back in Granny and Pap's room, but I'd already canceled it and and had them reissue it so then I just threw that one away and then one of them I actually lost my purse and my check was in it but the kind of people who found my purse they didn't take anything out of it they were uh, if you're a local person they lived over on uh, 141 there used to be a you probably remembered if you've been here your whole life there was a place where there was hubcaps the hubcap place that was the people that had my purse and they called me and uh, I went and got it. They they only had opened it to find out whose it was and called me to come get it. So really nice. My check was still in that, so I got it back. It's such a different time. I hope you enjoyed this part of the book. Please leave a comment and tell me what jumped out at you. Please drop back by next week. We've got to see what happens to Verna May next. And I hope you're enjoying this book as much as I am.